Hi folks, let's fix the toolpath to really correctly machine these fingers. Welcome to another Fusion Friday. I love this. This was a part that a follower of the channel sent in. and They took a stab at the machining operations. I think they were newer to Fusion 360. And you know what? They did a pretty darn good job. Um, they did an adaptive to clean out this area, a pocket, which I probably wouldn't have used. I would have skipped to the contour, uh, a slot here, which is actually a great operation. I don't, I don't use enough. But then here's where they had problems. Uh, they were using a 3D adaptive, which is a great toolpath, but they were struggling with some toolpath containment and just general machining strategy. And I wanna focus on how we can do a better job on cleaning up one of these fingers. So first thing to remember, adaptive toolpaths are not finishing strategies. I would, however, still love to use one here because when we do the finish machining of this finger, we're gonna use a ball end mill. And that end mill has very little or very poor surface finish right here at the bottom center tip, it has very little ability to evacuate chips. It's just not turning fast enough. It's a problem with any ball end mill. So when I use them, I want to do two things. I wanna have removed as much of the material as I can before I bring in the ball end mill. And I want to save them and keep them in really good condition because when I use a ball end mill, I want it to be doing usually finish uh, quality surface finishes and precision and tolerances. So we're going to do a 3D adaptive to rough this out with a bull nose. And then we're going to come in and talk about some toolpath containment to get one of these fingers done really correctly. So I'm going to right click on their setup and I'm going to go duplicate. And I'm going to call it. NYC CNC Fusion Friday. I'll leave everything the same and I'll right click here and I'll choose edit on the 2D adaptive, excuse me, 3D adaptive. So protected, that's fine. We're gonna switch it, our tool to a bull nose end mill. See how it has big corner radiuses, but it's still flat in the middle. This means you're not going to be plagued with the same surface footage problems because most of the cutting is going to have occurred with that radius before any material is presented to the center of the tool. Much better option, much better way to machine the roughing strategy here. So let's see, your one eighth inch tool, second tab geometry. Right now, there's no machining boundary. And as a general rule, you're almost always going to want to pick one of them. Uh, I'm going to, a lot of what I've learned today, I'd like to thank Rob Lockwood for. He has a great video that I'll put a card into, uh, which is this video here called uh, Guide to Using Machining Boundaries. It's in HSM, but it's the same, almost identical to Fusion 360. A couple of different menu options that are have some different functionality, but totally relevant. And I would encourage you guys to watch that and learn. Uh, we're all encouraging Rob to push, put more videos out because his stuff is really good. So... I'm gonna choose machining boundary. Uh, oh, and I brought that up because he walks through what these three really are. I usually use selection. And when I pick selection, it's gonna say, well, what, what did you want to select? And this is a great example because the selection just sucks. If I hover over this finger, see how I get my black line? I'm gonna click once. See how that gives me a green line? And you can kind of see what it did. It sort of said, okay, well, you want to machine this finger, but I'm also going to include, uh, I'm going to include this whole area here, which darn it, that wasn't what I wanted. So usually what I can do, and we actually covered this uh, card here in our in DIY injection mold video. Normally what you can do is hover over your, your green line. See how it turns red? I'm going to left click once. See how it brings up this menu right here? Now what I can do is kind of real time update my machining boundary selection. So if I hover over say here and click once, now I have to click this green little plus. This is what sucks about this pocket is I, I've been playing around with it and I just can't get it to accept the full geometry that I want. Uh, it worked great in the DIY injection mold video, not working so great here. We'll come back to uh, a couple other ways we can handle this, but for now, uh, I'm gonna click, let's just click okay. I'm a big fan of just taking it baby steps. Don't try to um, skin the whole thing apart at once. Awesome. So we'll get a toolpath that's coming in here 
Um, let's click on our setup here. Simulate, turn stock on, go to tail toolpath, and we will click on the adaptive, and that's going to jump us through all of these options, sort of fast render. Now we can really look at what's going to happen here. So I like the fact that it's plunging down in already cut material, and you can see all of your cutting is happening with the leading edge of the tool, which means that your um, you're not going to be plagued with the surface footage problems. You're going to have better uh, gullet area in your end mill to do chip evacuation and so forth. So we'll wrap it through all of that. And again, we're only trying to rough this, so I may take a look at the machine time. 1 minute 33 seconds. I honestly probably wouldn't change that right now if unless this were a production run. And if it were a production run and seconds mattered, what you'd want to do is increase your um, let's see here increase your minimum or fine step down so let's just show that as an example um, and what it's gonna do is take chunk bigger stair steps which is probably still fine for the ball end mill to uh, inherit when it comes up so we went from 133 to 102 that's a huge deal in, in production you'll also um, you also know that it computed much faster which can, is something that can be really nice so Let's assume now that when the ball end mill comes up, most of that trough is gone. So again, the ball end mill just has to do the, the cleanup work, the finish work. 3D, parallel, and it's already got a 1 8 inch ball end mill uh, by default, which is fine. Next tab is geometry, selection. We'll do the same thing where I'll just pick the contour left click once, update it to say that, and click the accept that, and I'll just click OK. Yes, that's a terrible toolpath, it's the wrong direction, it's got lots of problems, but by clicking OK once, we've created it, um, and that way we can go back in and edit. If you do a bunch of work before you've ever clicked OK, and you say hit escape, it disappears, which, which is, let me try to tell you, that sucks when that happens. So first thing I wanted to do is fix the direction, see how they're going left to right, we would obviously want to run the machine front to back because machines are going to, every time a machine changes direction, um, yes, according to Sir Isaac Newton, uh, I believe that would be the correct physicist or scientist, um, you're going to get some movement in the casting and the machine in the head, like it or not, no matter how expensive of a machine that you've got. So it passes, pass direction. If you let the window pop up, it kind of explains through this. We're going to, I'm going to assume 90 degrees works here. Awesome, so that reoriented it sort of front to back instead of left to right, which is great. Now, take a look. Obviously, we want a finer step over. So, under the fourth tab passes, right now the step over is set to 62 thousandths. If we were doing a finish um, pass on this, I may say I want 5 thousandths step over. Now, here's the thing. There's actually a fair amount of wasted... Uh, motion and time in this operation. If we take a look, it's at two minutes and nine seconds. And again, this is what really Lock, Rob Lock, Lockwood's video helped me understand. I'm going to switch to a wireframe view, display settings, wireframe. If I go into a simulation now, turn off stock, show all toolpath. Take a look. You know, when the cutter is, I'll click right here. When the cutter is right there, that's pretty good. You know, the, the uh, tangential point of the cutter is right, you know, halfway up the sidewall of the part. It's clearly doing work. I like it. But let's go up here. When I click on, say, this point, that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, if, if we go back a little bit, you know, the cutter ought to have been done doing most of its work, you know, all the way down here because that's where it was pretty close to finishing up. And again, this has to do with what tolerance uh, or variation you're willing to accept, because at the end of the day, unless your tool's radius perfectly matches the, uh, the geometry of the pocket, there's going to be some amount of interpolation or scalloping. Even if it's almost it's incredibly minute, there's some amount. But so why do we have, you know, that was this, this guy right here, Look at all this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 or so passes that are basically 
um, excess time wasted, and that stinks. If we take a look, you can see how it's doing all this cutting all the way at the top of the part. Let's get rid of that. Right click on parallel, edit. There's two ways to go about this. I would have originally fought with this tool center on boundary and tool containment. The idea being when its tool center is on the boundary, that means the tool, the center of the tool can come all the way up to the uh, red line or the green line here. And that means, again, you're going to get what we were just showing, which is when the tool starts, it's going to be directly on center, which is a lot of extra air. So you may think, well, let's go tool inside boundary. Click OK. Sure enough, we're going to get a much narrower toolpath. But the question is, is that really what we want? Let's see if we can take a look. problem here is look where the tool the first tool pass is going to leave a sliver of material up here because the side shank of the tool has to stay inside of our uh, our boundary selection or selection which is this line I think right here so that's actually no good either and again the old John Saunders would have right clicked and then said okay well you know what I'll just do some additional offset that's just going to let me uh, expand it tool inside boundary plus say 20 thousandths and I would have fudge factored this and just thought okay let's get it close anyways I won't bother showing you that there's a better way to do it go back to tool center on boundary no offset contact point boundary click OK and what this is going to do is amazing it's awesome you may say whoa what happened there this is super wonky look at all that well it is a little bit wonky part of it's because we've got a bad selection back here which I'll come back to this part here is actually ends up I think being pretty darn good but let's take a look at this first lead in that's what I care about this is the last there we go right there and look it's putting the top there's a little bit of a graphical thing going on here I think this is actually correct though where um, it's putting the tangency point right at the selection, which is exactly what we want. So we don't have less motion than we need. We don't have more. We're not going over top of it. In terms of all the noise up here, that's kind of necessary because you take a look at the way this pocket uh, tapers. It's kind of a little funky. So if you, you can play through this, it's really fun. And look, wireframe is really the way to go here. You know, it needs these lines. It basically is a much smarter way to look at how to, it's almost like a rest machine. It's, anal it's analyzing what we need to machine uh, to minimize it, but you're not, or you shouldn't at least get what I've had, the problem I've had before, which is you'll uh, run the toolpath on top of this, this surface here, and you'll get some little scalloped or tool marks on the top of your surface. And that's no good, because you want the tool to only be cutting these fingers out. In terms of how to fix the selection for this, uh, finger pocket here. Here's the only way I could figure out how to do it. We're going to go back into model. Activate my component. And we'll do sketch. Project. Project. And what I'll do is click. Let's see here. What do I want to. Oh, it's asking me for a plane. I'll click the top of this. That's fine. And now, what do I want to project? Well, I want to project this, 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 that. That's all I'm going to project. Click OK. Now, I'm going to expand my component up here in the top left. I'm going to hide the body. That way I can just see, or better just, hmm. It's annoying. I guess when I did the project, it's giving me, oh, there we go. Well, it's giving me this per, uh, orange thing, which is annoying, but oh well. What I want to do is manually <clears throat> add some geometry. So I'll hit L for line, click. I'll just drag up here. And now, knock on wood, I've got my own decision. Um, and, you know, if I wanted to tighten this up, I could say make this 0.05, and that shortens that up a little bit. Turn my body back on. You can see the selection now should include uh, most of this, although actually I just realized it's not going to include this curve here. So hmm, that's a good question. 
Let's see what it looks like. We could actually, uh, let's delete what we made. Let's do sketch project. One, two, click OK. L for line, and now, no, that's OK. And I'll use a sketch constraint to fix this. I want it to be perpendicular there to there. D for dimension, and we'll say make this 0.02 nice and thin. Stop sketch. So now I've got this area. Let's hop back into cam. Right click on my parallel. S delete the chain. And let's turn that sketch on. So up here, I can expand the part in the component sketches. And I wish I could click sketch nine. Um, but if I click that, boom, look at that. Now you have total parametric CAD control of your CAM machining boundary selection. How awesome is that? That's hugely powerful, folks. Now I've got the ability to control this toolpath in a much smarter way. And honestly, look how nice it is much nicer it looks. Uh, I will share that there may actually be some better ways to machine some of this sloper, steeper stuff. It's one of the interesting things about 3D uh, operations is there's, you know, different operations are better for different styles and shapes and angles and ramps and slopes and all that. But we're going to wrap it at that today. Uh, folks, I love that I get to do this. I love trying to learn and take advantage and tackle Fusion 360. I love hanging out with smarter people than me. It's one reason why I've enjoyed uh, watching Rob Lockwood videos. Uh, again, I encourage you to check out uh, this 14-minute video on machining boundaries. Take care, folks. See you next Friday. Mm -hmm.